Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Bites Podcast. Today's episode is about gut health, immunity, and postbiotics. Yes, I said postbiotics. I know you've heard about probiotics, and you may have heard about prebiotics, but if you've never heard of postbiotics, this is the episode for you. I have two expert guests today, Dr. Justin Green and dietitian Carrie Gans. Dr. Justin Green is the Director of Scientific Affairs at Cargill Health Technologies, where he's responsible for the ongoing research and scientific studies of existing Cargill Health Technologies ingredients, as well as the research and development of potential new ingredients. Dr. Green has over 14 years of experience specific to the field of dietary supplements. He received his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biophysics at Columbia University and did postdoctoral research at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Carrie Gans is a registered dietitian nutritionist, certified yoga teacher, and author of The Small Change Diet. She's well known for her media expertise and The Carrie Report, her bi-monthly podcast and newsletter, which conveys her no-nonsense and fun approach to living a healthy lifestyle. Carrie was on the podcast way back on episode number 18, and it was called Diets Don't Work. And she's been kind enough to invite me on her podcast as well. Episode 11, How Does Beef Fit into a Healthy Diet and Our Planet? Dr. Green and Carrie, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Yeah, great to be here. So excited to talk with both of you. Before we dive into the topic, I always love to hear from my guests a little bit more about yourselves and your interest and expertise in the topic, postbiotics, as well as any disclosures you have regarding today's episode. So, Dr. Green, shall we start with you? Sure, yeah. As you said, I have a PhD in, in biochemistry. Uh, I came into the nutraceutical world, so nutraceuticals is what we call them, ingredients that are good for your nutrition. Um, about 15 years ago, I direct scientific affairs for the company I work, which means I oversee the human clinical trials to show that uh, you, you actually are getting a health benefit from the ingredients that we, we provide. And to that end, I will say that I work for Cargill, uh, and we make an ingredient that will be my main example of postbiotics that, that we'll be talking about as we sort of give an example of, of one of these postbiotics. Okay, great. Thank you. Carrie, how about you? Well, thank you for that great introduction. I think you covered a lot of what I do, but also so your listeners know, I'm a advisory board member for Shape Magazine. I also write monthly for US News Eat Plus Run blog, where I've been writing, oh my God, since 2012, covering mm -hmm. hot nutrition topics. And I just love being back on your show. And yes, I loved having you on my show discussing beef. And I also do, and I guess what brings me here today with this episode on postbiotics is that I also do some brand consulting slash spokesperson work. And so one of my clients at present is Epicor. So that is what brings me here today. Awesome. Thank you. Now, this episode is not sponsored. However, our friends at Epicor Postbiotics have graciously provided support for submitting this episode for continuing education credit. So, if you're listening and you're interested in that, be sure to check my CEU library. And if it's not up when this episode releases, I'm sure it will be up soon. So check back. Also, I attended a virtual event hosted by Epicor, where I saw Dr. Green and Carrie speak on the topic of postbiotics, which coincidentally was the top item on my list of hot topics to address on the podcast in 2021. And we also did some yoga. Carrie led us through a virtual yoga session. And the theme was all about finding your balance, you know, in your gut and in your life. So it was really fun. So speaking of gut health and balance, it's been a hot topic. It's been on my show a lot. We're talking a lot about gut health and immune health. I mean, they're trending. Okay. So since our immune system is directly tied to our gut health, I feel it's really important for us to understand it and take good care of it. So this postbiotics are sort of the new kids on the block. So we're going to talk about the science of postbiotics, 
and understand how they support gut health and therefore immunity. Maybe let's start with you, Justin. If you could just explain how and why immunity is linked to the gut. And, you know, we like to get into the science on the Sound Bites podcast, but, you know, kind of explain that in simple terms as a launch pad for us. Yeah, great. My most fun way to talk about the gut and immunity is to think about a donut. So if you think of a donut with sprinkles on it, you know, when you're outside the donut, the sprinkles out there, they're on the outside of the donut. What if you go inside the hole of the donut and you have a sprinkle there? Well, it's inside the hole of the donut, but that sprinkle is still on the outside of the donut. Now, when you think of a person, Mm -hmm. you have your skin. Your skin is a a major uh, important organ to protect you from the outside world. It has to protect you from things that are toxic and other types of things that might cause a problem. But what if you go inside uh, your mouth, your tongue, and and, then the lining of your mouth? That's inside your mouth, but it's easy to see that this is still doing the same job your skin needs to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to take that even further. And you look at your lungs, you know, your lungs are inside your body, but it's still seeing the same thing your skin is seeing. It still needs to protect you from the outside world. But then its job is a little bit harder in that it needs to let something in. It needs to let in oxygen. Mm -hmm. Well, now we get to the gut. You take that donut hole, you go into your mouth, down your esophagus, through your stomach, through your small intestine, and through your large intestine. All that huge lining is seeing the same thing your skin is seeing. It needs to protect you from the outside world. And it's much, much bigger. Your skin is about two square yards. Your gut is about the size of a tennis court. That's how much area it needs to protect you from the outside world. And then its job gets a lot harder. It needs to let in a lot more than the lungs need to let in. It needs to let in all those nutrients that you need. The whole purpose of our digestive system is to let all sorts of different kinds of nutrients. But at the same time, there's going to be things that are toxic that you eat and it needs to keep those things out. And if that wasn't enough, you've got the microbiome. Mm -hmm. The microbiome is an environment of all these different species of bacteria. And some of them are absolutely essential to our good digestion. Our gut needs to foster that bacteria and let it thrive in order for your uh, digestive system to work right. But at the same time, it needs to be able to recognize bacteria that is not good for you or not good for your good bacteria and needs to beat that back. And so your immune system has to beat back that bad bacteria while allowing your good bacteria to thrive. So it's very complicated and it needs to be very robust and discriminating Mm -hmm. as far as that goes. Thank you. I love the analogy of the donut. And I think you explained that very well. This is very helpful. And, you know, I've learned a lot about probiotics over the years And I still find it complicated. And so I'm just always eager to have this review and and it sinks in a little bit more each time. So Carrie, as I said earlier, I think most people have heard of probiotics by now. Um, Maybe they've heard of prebiotics as well, but I think postbiotics might be new. Um, And there's a couple other terms that we might get into as we talk about the science, but I would love for you to kind of break down for us what are postbiotics? How are they different from pre and probiotics? Well, before I start on my explanation, I also want to agree with you, Melissa, that it's always something new to learn. And I love when Justin speaks. I love his analogy on donuts. And I don't know about anyone else, but now I'm craving a donut. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Not necessarily one with sprinkles because that's not the one I would want, but I would like a nice powdered donut with a glass of milk. (laughs) Anyway, let's get to the nitty gritty of what exactly, how do I like to describe the difference of a prebiotic, a probiotic, and now the exciting postbiotic? Yeah. I like to think of it this way. Really simple. Prebiotic is the fuel for a factory. So let's put this whole thing into thinking about a factory. So pre- is the fuel. It's what feeds the pro. Mm. And the pro are the workers. So you have the fuel, the prebiotics. Now it gets into the factory and you have those workers, those busy bees. Those are the probiotics. They're doing the work. And then you have the end result. What comes out of that hard work? That is then the postbiotics. So that's how you think of it, as a factory with three different sets of things going on, the fuel, the workers, and the end result, also known, if you want to think of it as the gift, 
And there you have the postbiotic. Okay, thank you. And I, and I will say, because this is obviously an audio podcast, there are some wonderful visuals that I will share in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. And we have some wonderful websites and resources so people can visualize this. There's some really great graphics. So all of these are important, pre, pro, post, and they all contribute to gut health, immune health. And we're going to continue the conversation on that today. But I wanted to also kind of ask a couple of questions about pre, pro, and post before we move on to really kind of diving more into the post. I love how you say it's like the fuel, the factory, and then like the product or the gift. And prebiotics can be fibers, right? Yeah, they tend to be fibers. Okay. There are some um, prebiotics that might be for instance, polyphenols that our microbiome can digest, and sometimes they'll trim it down and make it more uh, bioavailable for us. So it doesn't necessarily need to be fibers, but your classic uh, prebiotic would be a fiber, yeah. And that is why I also then put that to food when we talk about prebiotics. So they're Mm -hmm. somewhat easy to consume because a lot of foods are rich in prebiotics. For example, uh, oatmeal has uh, prebiotics, garlic. I mean, so there's different fruits and vegetables that have prebiotics in them naturally. Okay, great. And there are foods that have probiotics in them and there are foods that have postbiotics. So we're going to talk more about that. But that's something that I think is an important point of clarification when we're talking about pre, pro and post. We're not necessarily talking about a supplement, but when we look at the diet and the food sources, that can lead us to then say, okay, Where are the food sources? Are we getting enough in our diet? How can we get more in our diet? And if not, do we need to supplement? So we're going to get more to that. Okay, so that helps me remind myself pre, pro, and post. So let's talk more about postbiotics. What are they and what are the benefits? And maybe, Justin, you could start with maybe the sciencey part of that. <laughs> right, sure. You know, one thing that it might not have been completely clear with Carrie is probiotics are alive. And postbiotics are dead, you know, and there's a consensus definition that I'll be getting into. I mean, you read the paper, they didn't want to say dead. They wanted to make a nice uh, yeah. word. So they say inanimate. So inanimate, oh. but it's dead. It means the same thing. Not live. Yeah. What you have is, as Carrie uh, was great about talking about with the factories, I love that metaphor, is that your microbiome might be lacking in a particular beneficial bacteria. And that's when you take the probiotics. So you might need more of a particular probiotic. And there's all sorts of kinds of probiotics, depending on the actual species of microorganism uh, that it is. So you might need more lactobacillus, which is great about eating lactose. You might want more bifida bacteria, which is great about eating fibers. Uh, And so you can supplement your microbiome by adding more of that live bacteria. Now with postbiotics, Those are um, going to be a a particular microorganism that has been grown up, not in your gut, but outside your gut. And what that means when you're growing up a particular microorganism, that's called fermentation. Mm. Okay. When our microbiome, our live bacteria eat up the fiber in our good foods that we're eating, we're actually doing fermentation in our gut. What postbiotics are is doing that fermentation outside the gut. It enables you to be very specific, very standardized, and be able to then do science on a very specific thing and look for specific effects. Again, there's many types of postbiotics, and it has to do with the microorganism that's being used to make it. You take that specific microorganism, you ferment it, you give it some nice food, you grow it all up, but in this case, you kill it all. You kill it all, you make it inanimate, uh, and then you dry it all down, and then you can have a, a standardized ingredient that you can then test in uh, human clinical trials so that you know what that particular benefit is going to be. And it's sort of as a background, what's interesting about postbiotics is sort of how it became um, uh, more popular. Now, Epicor has been around for uh, over 10 years. Uh, we didn't call it postbiotic at first. So Epicor is going to be the example of postbiotics I'm going to be talking about later. Okay. It, we called it a fermentate. Just another word for when you ferment something up and then you kill it and dry it all down. But now, very recently, postbiotics have hit the floor and came out of science done on probiotics, where you you tested the probiotic and then as a control, they killed the probiotic. It was assumed that the probiotic needed to be alive to get the health benefits. But sometimes the dead probiotic actually gave health benefits. And so 
people just say, okay, sometimes it's good to be alive. It can colonize your large intestine and that's going to put your microbiome back in balance and that's going to be good. But sometimes it's just what those cells made, what those microorganisms made during fermentation is what gave it the health benefit. And so a lot of terms came from that. Paraprobiotics was one of them. Mm. Metabiotics is one of them. Bacterial lysates, that just means you're killing it through lysing them. Uh, and even ghost probiotics, which just meant that it's not alive, but it's still giving uh, mm. giving you that gift that Carrie was talking about. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of science here, but it sounds like depending on whether it's alive or dead, not alive. Inanimate. Inanimate, right? Another like sort of complicated term. It makes me think of an inanimate object, like not moving because it's dead, I guess. Anyway, depending on the state of these different ingredients, I just call them health ingredient. I was thinking ingredient. Yeah. Okay. That they have different functions and different jobs and can benefit the body in in different ways. And what it also means as far as supplements specifically goes is uh, postbiotics are, because they're dead, they're a lot easier to work with. So it's very important when you're taking probiotics, this is a little uh, PSA, that you keep them alive. You might buy them at the store, but you need to look at the package closely to see how you're, you're supposed to store it, usually in a refrigerator, to make sure that you keep them alive or else they're not probiotics anymore. With postbiotics, you don't need to worry about that. And they tend to be very stable and, and you don't need to worry about uh, stability for them as much as you do with probiotics. But Justin, isn't that also then, when you were talking about the different probiotics, the different types specifically of microorganisms, isn't it also then that depending, one person can consume, let's say, that probiotic and based on their microbiome, they could either have um, reap some health benefits from it or they might not reap any health benefits from it. Is that not accurate? Yeah, both the benefits of prebiotic and probiotics are much more dependent on the individual's microbiome uh, than postbiotics would be. The postbiotics is it's a double-edged sword. You're more standardized. You're more um, you're more predictable uh, with postbiotics. Now you're not getting as much of the holistic sort of story you're getting with probiotics and prebiotics when you're really using a live organism to do what you need to do. Uh, but at the same time, you're you're getting much more standardized and much more predictable effects uh, with postbiotics. Mm-hmm. And my understanding is we still need them all. It's not that postbiotics are going to take the place of pre and probiotics or that supplements are going to take the place of food. But like we are talking about fermented foods, you know, we know that they're good for us. Actually, I, I did another podcast episode 162 on probiotics, prebiotics and fermentation. If people want to take a deeper dive into fermentation, but it's that these fermented foods are good for us, but when it comes to food, the amount of the pre or the probiotic or the postbiotic can vary. But then with supplements, it's a little bit more specific, right? Right. More predictable, as I like to say. It doesn't mean that the other things are not going to be a health benefit, but you know, you bring kind of science more to bear when you have the same thing over again and you can look for the same same aspects. Okay, right. Now you said there are different kinds of postbiotics. Do you want to kind of give us a, an overview of that? You know, just like there's different probiotics. So you have you have the lactobacillus, the bifida bacteria. You have different kinds of prebiotics. You know, most of them are fiber, but there's different kinds of fiber like inulin, uh, FOS, which is fructooligosaccharides uh, or FOS. You have different postbiotics and it all has to do uh, with two things. First, the uh, species of microorganism uh, that's being grown up. And in this case, you have more um, variety with postbiotics than you're going to get with probiotics. Mm. Most probiotics are bacteria tend to be in your microbiome, good bacteria that tend to be in your microbiome. There's a lot of those, so it's not like there's not a lot of variety. Uh, But with postbiotics, it doesn't necessarily need to be a bacteria that's in our microbiome. It can be other bacteria that they know that it has some bioactive things that it makes that could be good for you. It could be a fungi. Um, this is what uh, the example I'm going to give Epicor is from yeast. It's from Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the genus species of brewer's yeast or baker's yeast. Epicor actually uses baker's yeast. You even have postbiotics made from algae. Mm. Uh, so algae are single-celled uh, uh, organisms, and you can make a postbiotic from there as well. Now, all that said, uh, there's a very important aspect of uh, prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics that are absolutely essential. And that is that they confer a health benefit. 
you cannot call something a prebiotic unless it gives you a health benefit. Just because it's fiber, mm. it's not a prebiotic unless it gives you a health benefit. Just because you have something live that you're eating doesn't mean it's a probiotic unless it's been shown scientifically that it's giving a health benefit. And the same with postbiotic. Just because you're eating dried algae doesn't mean that it's a postbiotic unless that particular algae dried in a particular way. And that's the second part. It's not just the microorganism. It's the way it's made, Mm. uh, made in a consistent, well-documented way, will give you a health benefit. Thank you for clarifying that. Right. And I will say, again, as I said earlier, I'm always learning something new. So I never knew that it could be made from algae. (laughs) This is really, really interesting. But I do, I mean, just like Justin said, and Melissa, I know you know this, and just to reiterate it, is the importance of stressing that it does come with a health benefit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the questions that I'm always asked, especially when given interviews on pro, post, pre, is the bottom line is they only get that name Mm -hmm. if they come with the health benefit. Very important. Very important. Absolutely. So before we get into the story of how Epicor came about and the research studies, let's put a finer point on the postbiotic benefits to digestive health and immunity, since that's what we started with here. Yeah, I mean, maybe Carrie can talk about this as well, but your gut is is sort of the center of everything. You need a healthy gut to have good digestion, but a healthy gut is also important for all sorts of uh, health systems that you have. Immunity is one of them, and I I already talked in length about how the gut is connected with immunity. Uh, People don't realize, you know, they think about immunity, especially these days. They think about the dangers coming from the air. They think that our defenses are in our blood, our white blood cells. Our immune system has evolved so that um, it, it does take care of those dangers, but it also has all sorts of things that it needs to take care of with our gut. Uh, and so 70% actually of our immune cells are within the gut. It's not just immunity either. Um, that's an obvious connection. The, there's the brain. So a lot of uh, what happens in our gut will affect our brain and vice versa. Our brain can affect our gut. And there's all sorts of other things that the microbiome and a healthy gut I uh, will do for you. Thank you. Carrie, did you have anything to add? Basically what Justin said. I mean, I always like to put it this way that, um, and I do specifically refer to a lot to Epicor, and that's because that's where I've read the studies. And so when I give examples of postbiotic benefits, it's typically based on the Epicor ingredient. And because based on what I've read in the studies, that Epicor fermentate may help to support or maintain the gut microbiome, the gut digestive health. Also, that's when we talk about that Epicor fermentate may help support daily immune health and basically help support the immune system for everyday challenges that we might run across in our everyday life. Yeah. You know, anytime you have a postbiotic, uh, it's probably going to work in your gut. Maybe the algae notwithstanding, uh, you're probably going to be using a microorganism that your gut uh, recognizes and is using beneficially. And so it's going to stem from the gut. Now, it might not just be digestion, but it's going to stem from the gut. Okay. And one other question before we move on, what foods would contain postbiotics? With postbiotics, you really are getting towards a supplement ingredient. And that's because you are um, specifically making it. Now, it can be added to a food, but you are getting the metabolites. So postbiotics are the metabolites of fermentation. You are going to be able to get those metabolites in fermented food. It's just that it's difficult then to call that a postbiotic because it's not as standardized as a postbiotic is supposed to be. By the way, these consensus definitions that I've been talking about are put out by a group of scientists uh, who call themselves the, the International Scientific Association of Pro and, and Prebiotics. They also have a consensus definition of fermented food, uh, and that's where you don't have to be as well defined. Um, Mm -hmm. So this is where you can have a mixture of different microorganisms, and you have the products of it. So you kind of have everything. You have the live organisms, you have the metabolites that are being made, and that's where you're really getting into foods that are good for you for the same reason that postbox are good for you, in that there's metabolites, and of course there's beer uh, and and wine. Um, Mm. Those are a couple of them, but there's also other other great uh, fermented foods. Right. We also, sourdough bread um, goes through uh, fermentation, miso, kimchi. But I always like to say, uh, not everybody loves those foods. (laughs) So even though you might be getting some postbiotics, how much you're actually getting 
is uh, debatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yogurt is also a good uh, fermented food. And kefir, and kefir, That's another true. one. That's right. So there, there's a list of them. So Melissa, it's interesting. So we could all eat those foods and your gut and your microbiome, you might end up getting X amount of postbiotics where Justin and his microbiome is completely different than yours. He might only get X amount. I can't say he's getting more. Okay. It's not a competition, but we all have different microbiomes. So we will react differently to the foods that we eat. Mm, Very good point. Okay. It's all kind of personalized nutrition in a way. Yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. So Epicor postbiotic is a whole food yeast fermentate ingredient, and it's found in many supplements, and we're going to talk about that. But I understand that there's a really interesting story about how it was discovered serendipitously, and it has to do with agriculture, which I love. So Justin, can you tell us the story? Yeah, I'll talk about Epicor, and I'll I'll try to um, sort of bring it as an example to to make you understand a little bit better uh, even what postbiotics are. So it goes back to the early 1900s. There was a a livestock farmer in Iowa, and he knew that when you give spoiled food, uh, table scraps, uh, to your animals, it actually makes them more healthy. This wasn't special knowledge. People have known about this since the time of the ancient Egyptians. Uh, but he wanted to make it easier for farmers to give that health benefit uh, to their animals. Because after all, you're eating a different dinner every day and you don't know how much is going to be spoiled. Hmm. He wanted to sort of standardize it and make it easier uh, for the farmers to give those benefits of fermented food to their animals. So he developed a way to do fermentation uh, in a plant Uh, Do it the same way every time. Take the fermentation solution. Essentially, you're taking Saccharomyces cerevisiae, this uh, baker's yeast. You're growing it up in a specific way. Uh, And then in this case, they're taking this. It's wet. They spray it onto the animal feed. Mm. uh, And it kills it uh, during that spraying process. And then the animals can eat that feed. And then you can see if the animals are doing better. And if you, it sounds like you, you know some farmers, Melissa. If you know them, they're not going to spend a single extra cent on their feed, unless it's going to give them uh, some more money on the other end. Mm -hmm. And that was exactly what happened. The chickens were more healthy, so they laid more eggs. The cows were more healthy, so they gave more milk. And the baby animals survived uh, much better Mm -hmm. as well. And so during over 75 years, this company honed fermentation technique, changed the ingredients that the yeast was was, was eating, changed the way, and then they processed it at the end until they got the most healthy uh, ingredient that they can. You know, they've been doing this for 75 years, but now they're right where um, a lot of farmers uh, want them to be, which is a is a natural way to uh, benefit the health of their animals without having to use as much as with antibiotics and things like that. So then what happened was about 20 years ago, they noticed that the people who were working in that fermentation plant were not putting as many health claims through as the people who were in the office of that same company. Usually it's the other way around. Usually the the plant workers are in a little bit more uh, dangerous situation. They put in more health benefits. The light bulb went off. Uh, They did some pilot studies on these uh, the, the plant workers and noticed that their immune systems were more healthy. And so the light bulb went off. People are animals too. Mm -hmm. Uh, We should make this for people. So they changed it a little bit. Of course, they made it in a different factory so that it would be food grade. Uh, They don't spray it on the feed. There's the last step. uh, They kill it this way through heat, and they sort of concentrate it so that it can go into supplements. Uh, But that whole fermentation backstory comes from there. And it really gets to what a postbiotic is. You're growing something up you know, and that you know is going to give good health. Uh, you kill it, you dry it down, and then, then you have the postbiotics. All those great metabolites uh, that the yeast makes uh, during this process. Excellent. Thank you. That is very, very interesting. I love that story. So would now be a good time to discuss the research and the science? Yeah, yeah. So just because Epicor is made from growing yeast in a very specific way, very specific microorganism, uh, and all of it is killed, does not make it a postbiotic. I want to drive that home. You need to make sure that you have shown that it gives health benefits. In the case of Epicor, with this particular species, this baker's yeast, we have had it go through over a dozen published studies eight of them human clinical trials that have shown that in humans, it does help support a healthy immune system and help support a healthy gut and help modulate the microbiome in in beneficial ways. Excellent. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the research. Uh, You know, you'll kind of have to decide, you know, with 
how much science we can get into. But certainly my listeners appreciate hearing more about research in science. So you said over a dozen studies and human trials. Right. So there are human trials on immunity, various ways that you can show that a person's immune system is is being supported uh, by Epicor. Uh, And we've also done some gut studies as well with Epicor. What those showed, um, we had model studies because it's very difficult to show um, how something works in a human gut because it's it's just hard to get in there. So a model study is... Well, it'll be, so you have five beakers and one is is the stomach. Uh, Then you have a tube going to one that's the small intestine and a tube going to uh, three beakers for the different parts of the large intestine. Uh, You'll have stomach acids in the stomach one. You'll put the food, you'll put the uh, treatment in that first one. And then you'll put actually an inoculum of of a grad student's fecal sample in the large intestine one to sort of make that microbiome. And you see uh, what happens. One of the things that a good bacteria does, you always hear about good bacteria, but some people don't realize what is good about them. One of the sort of classic things that it does is chew up the fiber in our food and then give us what's called short chain fatty acids. That sounds very sciencey, uh, but it really is just taking those long fiber molecules and making them shorter so that they provide energy for the lining of our gut. So we have very important cells that line our gut. Uh, A lot of them are involved in in bringing in nutrients. A lot of them are involved in immunity. Uh, And they like to get their energy uh, from the source. They don't want it to just be absorbed, go to the liver, uh, go around our blood system, then come back to them. There's energy right there, thanks to our microbiome, that it can uh, utilize. Very interesting. And what they saw with Epicor was that in this model study, it was able to make uh, those short-chain fatty acids just as well as prebiotics do as well, and uh, modulate certain beneficial bacteria in good ways. So we took that research and we um, then looked at how it it do in humans. And sure enough, in a study, they were able to show that over time, uh, Epicor did beneficially modulate certain bacterial groups. So one of them has to do with the uh, for me, I'm going to be saying these Latin words, but Formicutes bacteroides uh, ratio. These are two types of bacteria. You want more of the bacteroides, and it actually, that ratio was uh, beneficially modulated by the Epicor. These are the groups that are involved in that short chain fatty acid production. Uh, Prevotella was increased. This is a group that will be low in people with mild constipation. Something called uh, enterostipes uh, was also increased with Epicor, and that is also involved in making short-chain fatty acids. So the, all these bacterial groups were benefited, whereas some pathogens uh, were actually uh, decreased in the Epicor group as well over time. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so now that we've dug into the research a little bit, um, I'd love to hear about, because one of the things that was kind of an aha for me is that Epicor is not just necessarily the supplement, that it's an ingredient and it's found in a variety of supplements. So could you talk a little bit about where do we find this? What do we look for? Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier about do we still take pre and probiotics? Do we take them all? Do we take them with food? Do we do one or the other? Does it depend? Do we talk to our healthcare professional to, to get some advice? Well, specifically with Epicor, for some other postbiotics, again, I want to, I want to emphasize that Epicor is not the only postbiotic out there. It really depends on each separate postbiotic is going to be a different species of microorganism prepared and fermented in a certain way. Okay. What Epicor is, is a specific way that gives you a fermentate. Okay. So this is a word that you can also look for when you're looking for postbiotics. Well, all fermentates are going to be postbiotics. And you can look for the word fermentate specifically for Epicor. It would be a yeast fermentate or a dried yeast fermentate. Or even you see uh, the word whole food yeast fermentate because that's supposed to differentiate it from isolates of the yeast. So specific aspects of the yeast could be isolated. Epicor uh, as a fermentate is everything. So sometimes you see whole food yeast fermentate. And you can go to our website, epicorhealth.com, if you want to learn uh, uh, more about it and and see some of the other supplements that are in it. Because we, we don't actually sell supplements. We sell to companies that make supplements. And so you'll see Epicor Mm -hmm. and dozens of different supplements out there, all in different ways. So you'll see it, of course, in capsules, but you'll see it in beverage uh, drink mixes, in chews, or like Starburst, uh, all all sorts of different ways you're going to find Mm -hmm. Epicor. And you can look for the word Epicor as well. So um, you're seeing in all different ways. 
Uh, and the one thing I want to emphasize also is the, is the dose. Another thing about postbiotic is dosaging is very uh, more standardized than you're seeing with probiotics and prebiotics. One of the big confusions about probiotics is how much you're supposed to take. Um, they talk right. about the, uh, the CFUs, that stands for colony forming units. Very different from any sort of other ingredient where you just weigh it out, right? Um, it's in the number of cells uh, that are in there. And the science is very uh, inconsistent, even on the same probiotic, on, on how much you're supposed to take uh, for it to be beneficial. But prebiotics, it's, uh, it's quite a lot that you need usually to get that health benefit. And I'll, again, sometimes the science isn't very consistent. Usually with postbiotics, you're going to see a consistent dose. And with Epicor, that's true. You know, you're supposed to take 500 milligrams a day of Epicor. So also look for that on the label. And I also think just to clarify, I mean, yes, you're looking for that ingredient of which uh, Justin said the different, the dried yeast fermentate or the yeast fermentate or actually the Epicor. And it is found in some supplements that you might be aware of. For example, a line is a popular one and you can find it in a line. Mm -hmm. They make actually what's called kombucha on the go. It's also found in Country Life and they do one called gut connection, immune balance. They also do it for kids. So I think that's also interesting to know that it's also found in supplements for kids, but the dose is lower. For the children's dose, it's actually 150 milligrams for ages four to eight, and then it goes up to 300 for ages nine to 12. So it could be taken by children. And then you can also find it in another brand that's popular um, that's called Healthy Origins, and that is actually just the Epicor. It says actually natural Epicor on it versus the other ones where it's not listed front and center, but listed as an ingredient. It may have other ingredients in it as well. You even have them in pet supplements now. So Zesty Paws has a supplement with Epicor in it because they're... Uh, I did not know that. And yeah. obviously, <laughs> how did I not know that? And why doesn't Cooper have one? Right. I do not know. So now, obviously, I and my husband can't be the only ones in the family taking it. We now need to get one for Cooper. Okay, so that is good to well, know. Well, does Cooper take probiotics, Gary? No, Well, I'm a fan of postbiotics. We're a postbiotic family, okay? So... Well, you, he's got to do the postbiotics, right? My Roscoe, years ago, before he passed away, he had a daily diet that included oatmeal and probiotics <laughs> in addition to his... Because you're a good dog mom. That is why. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and his, yeah, his uh, fish oils too. Of course, of course. Okay, <laughs> right. I, we, talk, we talk the same language. And if he was still around, he would definitely be on CBD oil because he was so anxious. But anyway, uh, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you'll have to get the, the doggy postbiotic. I must. I'm on it. I'm on it. That's all I have to say. Okay. Well, you answered the question about the dose before I got to that. So thank you for covering that. What else do we need to know about the science of postbiotics, uh, benefits? I think we are pretty well versed now on what to look for on the label and the dose. W what else would you like to share with us? I think what I always like to say, though, it is a part of of a healthy lifestyle. So there's not just one component. I mean, I know we're talking about postbiotics and that was specifically your question, but I do like to add that a healthy lifestyle is what really counts at the end of the day. And so we can't just say, okay, I'm going to take a supplement and I'm going to take it, you know, when I'm feeling like I need it and I'll be done with it. No, if you're going to supplement, first of all, it should be that it should be a supplement to your healthy lifestyle to your healthy eating patterns. You also need to make it then a daily ritual, not just like, oh, when should I take it? When I remember to take it, mm. it doesn't work that way. It does not work. No. Right. So we need to think, do you get enough sleep? Are you physically active? How is your overall diet? Are you eating plenty of fruits, vegetables, 100% whole grains? Then how do I enhance that? And as we've discussed through the science that we have brought to you today, is a postbiotic can be part of that. Excellent point. Thank you, Carrie. You're welcome. And Justin, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, just to emphasize that, you know, we've been talking a lot about Epicor, but there are other postbiotics. The number one thing, and this is where the internet is, again, a double-edged sword, but you can do the research. Mm. You want to make sure that you go out there and uh, make sure that the postbiotics that you're looking for have the science that back it up. And you will be able to see that with Epicor, uh, it, it does. Excellent. Thank you. And like I said earlier, I will have all the resources links in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. I also wanted to mention that, you know, we've been hearing a lot about immune health over the past year or so. And I think for any health professionals listening, 
you know, I think it's really important that we talk about immune health in terms of supporting or maintaining instead and not use terms like boost immunity and, and really to kind of stick with those preferred terms so that we're not uh, hyping things up and confusing people. Yeah, that's a great point. What I like to say is rebalancing because mm. as I said, your immune system, whether it's your gut or your the rest of your body is a very complex, well-oiled machine uh, mm-hmm. produced after billions of years of, of evolution. It has seen everything and it knows all the different nuances that are involved in, in, in making a good defense without overactivating. And when it comes to an immune uh, ingredient or a food that's good for your immunity, what I think it's important is that it's not being the thing that's giving you good immunity. It's allowing your immune system to do what it's meant to do in the first place. Your immune system goes out of balance in modern life, uh, whether it's from stress, uh, from your work or traffic, or from pollution, or from bad food, or from not getting enough sleep. Uh, that can put it out of balance. And then on the other side of the coin is the way we were raised. So our parents wanted to keep us as healthy as possible. And one of the obvious ways uh, they thought they could do that was to keep us as clean as possible. <laughs> uh, so our skin was clean. Our rooms were clean. Our clothes were clean. Our food was clean. Infants had the cleanest food on earth, uh, which was great. It probably kept us from getting some diseases, but it also didn't allow our immune system to learn Uh, what was dangerous and what wasn't dangerous. And that's why you're getting a lot more allergies these days. And so Mm. when you look for an an immune supplement or a food that's good for your immunity, what you're trying to do is get your immune system back the way it was meant to be, because that is really is going to be the workhorse, is going to be the machinery that's going to be able to to keep you as healthy as possible. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's a perfect way to wrap up this segment. Thank you both so much for coming on the show and sharing all this interesting information. I really hope people go to epicorehealth.com There's also epicorimmune.com. Like I said, I'll have links in my show notes. And in addition to the episode I mentioned, 162, that involves fermentation, there's also another episode, 168, that gets into some of the short chain fatty acid conversation we were having as well. So thank you both so much. Thank you for having us on. Yeah, thank you. That was great. My pleasure. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind and check out the postbiotics. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke, produced by Jag in Detroit Podcasts.